Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So when we think about digital technology, as Microsoft, and I'm a Microsoft employee, uh, we tend to think about the tools that enable us to turn digital technology to make things in the world. I mean, it's partly because we're slightly geeky that we're able to bend digital technology to our will. So it feels natural to do that. But in the last decade, there's been a kind of rise in a different type of people who felt able to do that with digital technology. So we've seen more from those who craft rather than those who uh, engineer. So more hobbyist makers, feeling able to get their hands dirty with digital technology. And no, no course exemplifies that better for us than uh, uh, the Textiles Futures Masters at Central St Martins. So Richard and I were really keen to work with them on that. But even there, the two cultures don't really go hand in glove. We see in the studio the cultures clash. And we see master students who, for their degrees, have been dealing with age-old practices of things like teasing, spinning, weaving, now coming up against these new materials and taking inspiration from everywhere, including, as you'll see, science. So even, oh, Curtis is out the back, so I can't look at him, but even before Curtis sent us the brief, we were kind of exhilarated to be working with this school. So on our first studio visit, we were taken around a bunch of old looms, seeing people weaving in the old way, and then we're taken through to kind of jacquard looms fed by punch cards, and we're reminded that our own discipline, computer science, in a sense grew out of these ways of weaving of the past. Microsoft exists in a world of displays, from giant displays like this through to kind of PC-sized displays and phones, and it was really exciting that the Textiles Futures course took us out of that to a world in which uh, surfaces were thought of in new and conceptual ways and were just in no way defined by the pixel. So when we saw the students in action, the, both the winners and, and the rest of the course, it was very much technology as a new medium to shape the world. And technology took its place alongside bolts of cloth and bobbins of wool. I do like that phrase. <laughs> bobbins of wool. And uh, we were excited by the way in which, uh, in which craft makes you think differently about these things. For example, potters are excited by pots, not clay. And that kind of differed again from the way we tend to think about it. So what difference does it make? We were delighted. They've created uh, materials for thinking. And uh, we're going to show you the two of the winning projects now, but you could go out to the booth tomorrow and find out about some of the others. You'll see that these are come from a different place from our kind of computer science background, both in terms of skills and language. And we, we feel it gave us a new glimpse into a domain that we thought was ours. So I'd like to introduce Amy and Natsai to tell you about the projects. this quickly out first. <laughs> Ready? Hello everybody, my name is Natsai Chiesa and I'm Amy Congdon and we're from Central St Martin's College of Art and Design. Um, we are currently on our uh, MA for Textile Futures at the college and it's a postgraduate course that uh, sort of looks to reinterpret materiality and uh, traditional textile and craft techniques. We sort of forecast these in future scenarios and um, are really looking to innovate in with our materiality. For this project, um, the work was largely studio-based and uh, supporting it was a range of strong material-led uh, workshops such as lace making um, as well as you know Arduino programming and um, our lecture series was quite interesting for um, 
for this process because it, it, it um, sort of integrated a lot of people from industry, ranging from organisations like Wired mag uh, Magazine, as well as um, design collectives like Random International. For us, from the Service Meet Social Brief, we were talked a lot as a group and were very interested in the thread that was running through it of human connectivity. So, whereas first as groups working with three or four people in each, we explored different themes but under the umbrella theme of human connectivity. We're both from the Social Pika group. The group also included group members Anne Christian Arbel and Laura Bueno. Sorry, just bear with me a sec. As a group, um, Social Pico was interested in the ways in which technology is changing the quality of our connections. And um, for us, a key piece of research was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This hierarchy of needs sort of looks to place social connections secondary only to survival and safety. As a group, we began um, our research by creating a series of conceptual prototype candy um, designed to act on the body as social enablers when eaten. So we took the candy out onto the streets of London. It formed the basis of our primary ethnographic research. And just to take you briefly through what each of the candies does, point one is the networking snack. So when you take that, it allows you to see people in a close proximity to you, whether they have similar interests, hobbies, or perhaps work in a similar field. So it allows you to network better. Point two is the GPS snack. So people existing in your network, you'll be able to see sort of friends and family where they are geographically located to you. And point three is the Faraday snack, which temporarily disables all personal digital connections. So, for example, when you use it, it switches off your cell phone, your laptop, so it allows you to have focused one-to-one -one communication with someone that you're with. <laughs> Um, our findings for the ethnographic research that we carried out with these suites revealed that most of the people who participated were interested in the networking snack. And we further sort of wanted to highlight, um, you know, the age demographic um, as well as the gender um, of the users. And this enabled us to create, um, you know, these fictitious um, personas who really for us stood out as um, an example of where our secondary research um, took us. Okay. I probably started taking social snacks really about three months ago. My favorite is number three, the Faraday suite. Technology, like the Blackberry, the iPhone, even if they're switched off, they can still be very distracting. So I tend to take one at weekends, so that I can have a normal conversation with my family, one-to-one. -one. I even wish I could get my husband to take them, so that when he's watching the football, he's not ignoring me. In fact, I'll take one now, and I'll switch you off. So... From the secondary research, which was looking at how people are using things like social networking technology, their existing technology, one of the, and also one of the key insights that came out of our ethnographic research when we took the candies onto the streets of London was that it was never questioned whether the suites worked or not. It was never an issue for anybody, which we found really fascinating. Um, so people have no problem with ingesting technology if it has a beneficial social networking effect. And this, we can kind of place this in a wider discourse that's happening at the moment in current issues and research. For example, cognition enhancement and smart prosthetics. I mean, we've been integrating technology in the body for a long time. I'm sure plenty of you know people who've got pacemakers. So these are all really interesting things that added to the project. And from a culmination of all the research and as a resolution of the suites, we developed the Social Pika Kits, which is a kit of edible social supplements to supplement your, your social needs. So in the same way some of you might take vitamins to uh, supplement your dietary needs, this kit you might take some pea correction with your lunch so that you can identify, identify what you're lacking in terms of social interactions for the day. So therefore supplementing your social needs. 
As a kit, uh, Social Peak is designed to fit seamlessly into your existing diet and uh, lifestyle needs. Um, the kit allows for bespoke meals to be created according to the various um, sort of social needs that you have that week. So, for example, on a typical morning, should you have meetings to attend during the day, one might add extra networking to their breakfast. Now, bringing back the um, hierarchy of needs, for us this project sort of highlights the importance of social connections and that technology is having an um, effect on how the interactions occur. Dana Boyd from Microsoft recently said that Facebook has become an essential utility like water or electricity. And uh, for us, this resonates with the findings of our research. Um, within the structure of the course, we were required to, within our groups, come up with a new research question. So what future means might we encounter to rethink the paradigm of communications technology? And this linked completely back with the original Microsoft brief, which states that service design is a meta design activity for intentionally integrating systems with customers via physical systems, information systems and human systems. And we wanted to explore our role as textile designers within the field of service design. For us, social media is all about human connectivity. Our and we feel that our creation of services needs to be placed in a more human-centred framework. Designing with the physicality of a textile background, we sought to question the existing models and to develop from them. And as an individual response, looking at some of the key th um, insights that we gained from the group research, I developed my project, which is called Data Hungry Skin. And one thing that I particularly focused on or was fascinated by was the fact that people were happy to physically adapt themselves to ingest technology if that it provided a, a desirable enough service. So I'll now take you through my project. At the beginning of the 21st century, technology began to reproduce itself, causing what is now referred to as the information smog epidemic of the 2030s. When it reached critical levels, people were left almost unable to function due to the sheer bombardment of data. The body needed to adapt or lose the evolutionary race. Dealing manually with numerous different devices and sources of information became impossible for users. New intelligent devices needed to be developed, yet there is still the basic human need to feel connected to others. Kipling D. Williams discussed, in the beginning of the 21st century, the importance of social inclusion and connection, stating that there may be social snacks that provide temporary stopgaps for social hunger when a social meal, e.g. interaction with an accepting other, is unavailable. The natural step was to integrate communication devices into the body itself. Developments in nanotechnology, synthetic biology and biotechnology provided a solution. The human body has become able to absorb information via the membrane of the skin. Synthetically designed and engineered data-hungry skin cells are grown in vitro, using a sample of the end user's DNA to ensure immediate biocompatibility. A connective skin graft adheres the cells to the body's surface, and metal hairs, or antennae, are designed to pick up specific bioencoded pieces of data. Feeding the body's need for feeling connected, the cells are the next generation in communication technology. When a piece of data is received, the physical reaction of the body, produced by the skin unit, mimics that which happens when the person comes into actual physical contact with another. Information now comes with health warnings, and inboxes are cultured at least every three days to check that a healthy blood data level is maintained. Different types of data have different nutritional values, with junk mail or spam being the same nutritionally as a burger once was, and a message from a lover as nutritionally comparable to that of a three-course meal. To be connected is to be well fed. So the project focuses on the ongoing proliferation of digital information and it was concerned with designing services to help cope with this. 
the service that the cells provide is to help the body to stay connected, but more importantly than that, the cells provide a benefit, a health benefit to the user with nanonutrients triggered by the data sphere. The project proposes a conceptual future scenario, but it's completely based within current um, issues and research and discourses, for example, in biotechnology, synthetic biology and nanotechnology. For me, the project wasn't about creating a working prototype, but it was completely about engaging with those current issues. For example, there is a radical shift happening in the definition of things like the artificial and the organic, the natural and the technological. For example, Kate Craig Venter's Cynthia cell was redefining what we did perhaps to term as life. So I saw my role as a designer in this project to provoke debate about these issues and to explore the future development and what this means for design. And as a textile designer, on a very basic level, I use textile techniques to produce these samples. But on a deeper level than that, I see the skin as a textile, as a material that is, can be manipulated and explored through these new technologies. I contacted Robert Freitas, who is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Molecular Manufacturing, to talk about the, the validity of the scenario that I proposed. He's doing some really interesting work on nanorobotics, things called pharmacites, which are small nanorobots which travel through the body's system, perhaps uh, delivering drugs where they're specifically needed um, or monitoring blood sugar levels or oxygen levels and he said that within the next 50 years this, pro this kind of project or product is completely viable so I was interested in the current shift that's, shift that's happening between disciplines taking techniques from one and merging them with another for example textile design here met service design and artists are working with scientists and it's all about technology feeding into new and exciting design potential. So I really want to leave you with a question of how will our relationships and expectations of service change when technology and its devices are part of us? If you want to talk more about the project or would like to get a closer up to the samples, then we'll be at DemoFest tomorrow. Thank you. My project was called um, Connections in Faraday and like Amy I um, was interested in a key insight that we picked up from the group work research in Social Pika. Um, I wanted to explore further the notion of Faraday and as a group in Social Pika we'd um, defined Faraday as only allowing face-to-face -face connections uh, while temporarily disconnecting the digital ones. So for me, it was about uh, reinterpreting this notion of Faraday in a contemporary um, discourse. An example of this in action is uh, the isophone, where here in Faraday is an amplified presence of one sense over the inhibition of another. Likewise, the transreceiver radio is a Faraday through interactive ritual, and these were two key compo components in the development of my idea. I almost wanted to take the Faraday and say, how could we in create a Faraday environment um, to you know, enhance the human connectivity? So I approached this project from a personal experience of mine where I'd been in a long term relationship for a period of uh, four years, um, long distance, and what happened during this time is that we used to talk a lot on the phone, so our conversation skills were really, really good, but um, on my return back home, I, we realised that actually we were no longer versed in the physical nuances of being in close proximity. So, you know, I really wanted to explore what was it that made that happen? And in conversation, we realized that it was a lot to do with the fact that when we were together on the phone, uh, we were always in quite safe places. Uh, we created our own Faraday environments. You know, it was about the time of day that we were speaking, uh, each of us in our quiet places. So for us, that was our Faraday.
find a conceptual prototype of a semi-living keepsake, an object that combines both the physical and the verbal nuances of communication. This keepsake is intended to be used when two people are communicating while physically apart. Um, the object places them in a well, the object places them cognit cognitively as well as physically without distraction within that moment that, that's been shared. The semi-living keepsake is made up of hair follicles that have been harvested from a loved one and are grown in vitro. Integrated in the keepsake is um, a intelli intelligent follicles um, and these are connected to each individual's nervous system. The follicles chart the emotional well-being of each user to their respective partners and thus offer a way in which to animate or mark a presence when they are apart. Through nurturing, these follicles develop and uh, sort of grow to, into mature hair. And for me, this is quite important because of the relationship that we have with um, you know, the notion of physicality and tactility. Hair as a material was quite a natural progression, um, mainly because, again, of its tactility, uh, the fact that hair is quite intimate and it's highly respon responsive. Our relationship with hair is incredibly emotional, and I found that when people interacted with my objects, they did so in in instinctively with incre incredible ease. So for me, I think that this project you know, takes material processes and repositions them in the context of research going on in biotechnology and the appropriation of life. Patricia Piccinini's uh, Still Alive with Stem Cells is one of those projects that, you know, further pushes this idea of nurturing organs without bodies. And she is, you know, a really well-known artist in this um, discourse who really pushes the idea that you know, are we using our own bodies in their full potential? I think that the service that this keepsake provides uh, is unique mainly because the material qualities of its in interface make it able to bridge both the virtual and the physical in a way that is natural and based on basic human instinct. It also seeks to provide a more human and tactile alternative to our existing digital interfaces by literally and metaphorically taking our most primal attributes as a means to enhance connections. Through nurture and a new level of intimacy, I think that what's happening here is that the ritual of communication is being enriched. So just to sum up, really, both of the projects and also the group work project looks at, the develop, uh, looks at development in technology and as textile designers, our emphasis is to design with the implicit understandings of materiality and process. And we feel it's a really exciting time for design and, a pot and the potential products which push existing boundaries and ideas. Thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you at DemoFest tomorrow. Thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> there's so many places to start. I, 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 I'm really intrigued, though, with the, uh, the, college, the Central St. Martin's College. Um, last year, uh, Lily Chang asked me to help her find a manual sewing machine, and that was the beginning of their projects and uh, followed through really interesting connections with the physical world. And I think those of us here who live in 98052 zip code kind of lose track of the, the physical reality of some of the, the things that design can do. Um, when I look at, at some of the things that you guys did, Bill Buxton would just, I think, love this, the, the prototyping of the, uh, the digital snacks and that you know, people <laughs> went for it. It was great. Um, it's really refreshing to see this kind of perspective on approaching the, the sort of the digital social networking kind of world and the questions that you ask. I think one of the most important things that I saw here was design, uh, great design is, is a great provocateur. It asks questions, it starts conversations. And boy, if that didn't start a conversation about you know, information smog and social networking, I don't know what will. But I think some of the issues that you raised here are really interesting and I don't think they're being asked today. Um, what I'd love to know from both of you is you've both taken different 
takes on this, and you've both asked some very provocative questions. Um, how do you take your design beyond the social commentary, and how do you influence um, more tangible things that are, are here today? I think you've done a great job of looking at the future, but I'd love to see some of that commentary um, go a little bit further. How, how do you do that with this kind of a project? Um, well, thank you. I think you're comp completely right in the idea of um, that design, when it's provocative, is really gets people to think. Because if you call something art, then you almost expect it to to be like that. So design, using objects that are p proposed for use is something that really pushes people and so that's what we were both really interested in looking at. Um, I think in terms of placing it in a more real future, the course is really good for that. We look at, um, for example, the next the first years that are starting in September will be doing a synthetic biology workshop. So, and a lot of the graduates have been working with that kind of thing. So it's quite possible and we're pushed to look at that. So that's something that I really want to explore in the final year because it's a, it's a two-year course. So looking at not just, but having that contextual framework, but then also pushing it with exploring the materials that you can get your hands on at the moment. I mean, some of them are obviously within labs or there's a lot of researchers saying oh, we can definitely do this in 15 years it, you know <laughs> we could just have a bit more funding but it's it's definitely happening and we try to get our hands on as much as possible to to work with so. i think it's also about people and understanding people from uh, not just a design perspective but you know textile is all about how people are engaging intimately with your with you know i mean on a basic level the folds the skin you know that sort of thing so we almost you know, with this brief, it was very much about saying to people, do you want a, no a social networking site? And if you do, what do you actually want it for? Um, I think that's what we really learnt on this course, um, well, this particular part of it, the, with, the, with this brief. Great, makes me want to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I echo that. I feel like for the first time in a while, I'm actually really inspired by, by student work and that you know, often I feel like you've kind of flipped the flip, flip the place here. I feel like the person learning, not the person giving feedback on something. You've gone a lot further than um, the other students conceptually, and that, well, so, so far that I've seen, um, and and that's to be commended. I mean, it's really, uh, really out there, really, really in provocative, really interesting, and um, and very thoughtfully undertaken. Uh, I really actually like the hair, um, the, the sort of touch component of the interactive hair thing as it you know animated around your hand I thought it was just very, natural. very beautiful <laughs> and uh, something something very compelling about that um, I, I, I don't know what else to say to be honest with you I just I really feel like um, I'm still reeling from all of the kind of big thoughts and um, and uh, just interesting little nuggets from social snacking and the whole idea of literal research technique that is just literally which one of these candies would you eat? And the way you presented that, I thought was really nice. Just the the slide, the really Spartan slide with the candies in the bottle, and just just really nicely done all, all around. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was really good. I mean, I th at first I was like, oh boy, here we go, <laughs> Central Saint Martin's <laughs> and Tim and Richard as guiders. This is not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be good. This is uh, really nice. Um, <laughs> Um, a little bit creepy at times, but I think that's, uh, you know, the thing that struck me was you took something that, that ordinarily is kind of a negative discourse around stem cell research mm -hmm. and turn it around on us a little bit to say, hold on a second, what's, what's wrong with uh, connectivity to human fiber? And, you know, it's just, I think it's a spin on textiles and fiber design that is unpredictable and but maybe much more relevant to today and certainly to the future if you look at where research is is most well funded it's in those arenas and to say that our our own skin and our hair are indeed a part of our natural fiber and fabrics of everyday life uh, and couple that with the fact that the time we spend every day is socializing uh, I think is a really uh, a really nice touch. So you know, well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>